Paul is now seated and has decided unilaterally to, to replicate the order of the, the visual here. Uh, they clearly like things to be accounted for properly. So that's the theme of uh, today's event. We're talking about you know, how we account for um, how we account within the GHG protocol and decarbonisation. It might sound like a bit of a geeky issue, uh, but of course how we account for um, electricity and decarbonisation is what really drives strategies in, in many companies. So it should be the heart of, you know, a really important issue and the heart of what we're thinking about. And I want to say hats off to, to Google. Um, my name's Catherine Dixon. I used to work at the IEA and we worked together with Google on exactly this issue, looking at the role of 24-7 procurement and how it can drive decarbonisation. It's a really important issue. So um, that's what we're here to talk about today. But before we go, let me just uh, introduce the panel here. So we have, um, starting from the left here, um, Nathan Ayer, who's a senior associate from RMI. Um, and he concentrates on federal industrial electrification policy and state level energy system modelling. Then we have Wilson Ricks, actually I've got in a different order here, PhD <laughs> candidate in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in Princeton. Um, so he's um, really looking you know, at the research and how, and how the decarbonisation and the accounting is really what it's really driving in the system. Um, Killian Daly, the executive director from Energy Tag, um, and that's a not-for-profit not focused on enabling the real-time electricity tracking that's going to transform the energy system. We've got Cyril, who's an, uh, a policy lead at Electricity Maps, an Austrian, an Austrian, and, and is that an important part of your biography, energy engineer, <laughs> who uh, previously founded his own startup in energy investments and worked as a consultant at the IEA as well. Um, and then, and Sarah here, you joined Google in 2021 to build and lead the company's standards program, which is going very well. Mm -hmm. So let's start, Killian, um, yeah. talking about scope two. Uh, can you explain to us uh, what it is and what you're working on in scope two? Sure. And why it matters. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so basically, um, scope two is about electricity uh, accounting. So how do I account for the emissions associated with my electricity usage? Uh, it's something I've been working on for a very long time now. So I used to be in a, a large corporate, a large industrial called Air Liquide, and I did all the scope to accounting globally, right? So I, I've done the accounting here, and I know there's pretty significant issues with how we do that accounting today that allows essentially you to get to, to a zero claim uh, without really having to deal with the tricky issues of the energy transition. Um, and I think fundamentally that comes from the fact that, you know, if you look at power markets, how they work, there's temporal and geographical restrictions. So that's something I, I did as an electricity buyer. 90% um, of my time was working on, on buying physical power. And then we hopped to carbon accounting. And you know it, it all looked very different. Right. And we all used to find that a bit, a bit confusing. Uh, and the two, I would say, major things to think about are temporality. Uh, so today, you do scope to accounting using annual averages. So you essentially, you, know, you can be 100% renewable powered from solar energy even if you're not storing that. So that, that's one big issue. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, deliverability. So we're not really thinking about, is there congestion? Can this electricity actually be delivered that I'm claiming? And I think those two issues lead to pretty significant problems that I think a lot of the other uh, panel members can, can address today. Great, thank you. So still a lot of um, very famous big companies are using the, this, this system to claim that they're 100% renewable. Um, so I'm really interested, Wilson, because you've been doing quite detailed research on this. Like, does it, does it matter you know, what systems people use? What, what, what does the research tell us about what it's really driving? Uh, yes, it, it does. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, my lab is really focused on um, system level energy sector modeling. And what we've, uh, in the last year, we've published a couple papers um, focused on essentially this larger question of when someone claims to use uh, clean power and you know, goes out and buys clean power for the purpose of claiming that their electricity use has uh, low or zero carbon emissions, what are the actual system level, and by that I mean like at the level of the entire electricity grid, carbon impacts of the actions they take to do that? Um, one of these papers was in the context of corporate or institutional um, clean energy claims. So you know, when you have your climate disclosures, what to claim as your actual scope to emission setback from electricity uh, consumption. And the other major context in which this is relevant now is in clean hydrogen production, where um, the US recently passed a um, very significant subsidy for zero carbon hydrogen production. 
contingent on the ability to demonstrate that you are using clean electricity to produce that hydrogen. And so the accounting system that you use to um, make those claims ends up being very important. What we've looked at is, depending on which accounting system you, um, you end up using, what are the actual system level impacts on carbon emissions that that incentivizes, uh, the actions that that accounting system incentivizes. And you know, that's what actually matters for climate change. And long and the short of our findings is that the kind of current conventional system of uh, kind of volumetric matching of your electricity consumption with certificates representing clean power, at least in the United States in the kind of intermediate term looking out to 2030, is liable to have very little impact on actual system level carbon emissions. And so you can have companies that you know, may claim to be using zero carbon electricity um, when the actual impact of the actions they've taken to procure that power is nearly the same as a company that makes no claims at all, or hydrogen producers that produce, you know, receive a very large subsidy and get certified as producing zero carbon hydrogen, um, when in fact their production actually increases emissions by potentially hundreds of millions of tons on aggregate. And so it'll be up to the US Treasury to determine <laughs> whether or not that's the case. Um, in contrast, we did find that when you actually get more granular, when you start accounting for electricity not just on a bulk basis, but actually in the time and location in which you consume it, that the actions that that incentivizes, which is basically procuring clean power at all times in the place you consume it, actually does lead to significant system level carbon reductions um, with fair consistency. And so that's been kind of a major finding of our work. Fantastic to have the evidence for that. So we've got a carbon accounting system then that where companies are claiming to have 100% renewable power and that's not actually driving the system's change in the power sector that perhaps even they think it might be. Um, so can we do it differently? I guess that's my question. So Cyril, you, you do a lot of um, electricity mapping data. Do, does the data exist? How, how do we do it differently? I think it's a great question. Also, thank you so much for the, the comments here. I think it's important to talk uh, not only what scope two is and the evidence, but also what does it mean for companies that need to, need to you know, who are the users who need to work with that, who need to uh, calculate sc scope two emissions. And if we're thinking of uh, rules that, or, or studies that show that going more granular, going more accurate is more impactful, we also need to think how companies are supposed to implement that. And I, I, I love to talk about this as a ecosystem maturity uh, versus technological maturity. Uh, and uh, if you think, if you, t if you ask me directly, is the ecosystem already ready for that? Uh, I would say uh, no. Uh, I don't think from tomorrow onwards we can just say, yes, everybody's just going to use more granular data, everybody's going to use more granular certificates and tools. Um, I don't think we are ready yet, but uh, there's something about the technology and the data that is already available today um, that is going to be fundamental to making uh, or providing this ecosystem readiness. So it is all about uh, providing data and tools to the, to the companies that are the, the, the consumers or the users of the greenhouse gas protocol and its rules, such that they can actually make uh, or, or conduct more, more, more accurate carbon accounting. So uh, I think from, from a technology readiness, we are definitely there. And if you think of it from an uh, electricity mass perspective, we're a company, we're mapping power systems data uh, across the world. We provide historical real-time and forecasted data on an hourly level. Um, so if you're a company in any of those 50 countries today, you can access uh, emissions data and, and use this emissions data in order to make more granular uh, account or to conduct more granular accounting based on your electricity consumption. Great. So we, we have the data and it can be done. Um, and, and Sarah, I think you're doing it already at Google. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that's been going for you. Um, yeah, happy to. And so just thank you for the opportunity. And let me kind of like pile on to all the um, really sort of well articulated comments here. Um, Catherine, if it's okay, maybe I'll step back and kind of answer um, or sort of share our thoughts on, you know, why we care about scope two reform um, and why we're advocating that it move in a direction towards, you know, more hourly um, and locationally matching. Um, so First, I guess what I would say is that the kind of original scope two guidance, sort of version, you know, one dot, you know, one dot oh, um, has been extremely successful from our point of view. It really built a foundation for um, uh, a voluntary market for clean energy. I mean, just in the last decade, 
corporate PPAs helped um, you know, develop 100 megawatts of new generation. So hugely successful, built a you know, very important foundation as we think about what's next. And so um, uh, you know, I think the question that like, we've been thinking about um, is like, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. um, and that's um, you know, sort of how we got to more granular accounting. And like, why do we care so much? I mean, there's a kind of two, two main reasons. Um, first, from just like a, a practical reason, um, you know, we really need operational footprints to be accurate for trust and integrity reasons. Um, uh, you know, for our own internal decision making, um, you know, we really want to have decision useful information, so accurate reflection of what our footprint is, um, especially in the context of um, rapidly emerging regulations. Um, we need uh, accurate reliable information. And certainly civil society, I think, is expecting accurate reflections of what a corporate footprint is. You know, there's been criticisms um, of the, you know, sort of first iteration of the scope two guidance, you know, and I think, you know, to be honest, some of those criticisms are valid. And um, civil society needs to have trust um, in the system that we're all using to reflect our corporate footprint. So that's kind of just like the practical reasons, just the importance of accuracy leading to um, a system that is, you know, um, garners trust. Um, and then there's sort of more like aspirational reasons, I guess, you know, I would say. Um, you know, we see the modeling, you know, that Wilson has described and, um, you know, grid decarbonization is going to require a lot of private sector investment um, to help get us to this sort of end state, you know, of full decarbonization. And how, you know, I think, Catherine, as you said, corporates, you know, we shape our, our strategies around the rules of the game. Right, and um, and so the rules of the game really matter. And um, just if you know, like from a scale perspective, how this matters. Um, Fifty percent. I think when I last checked, you know, thanks to Oxford, um, you know, they put out this like net zero tracker. And um, uh, when I checked earlier this week, I think it was 972 companies. So 50 percent of the world's largest 2,000 companies by revenue have a net zero target. So 50 percent of companies are going to be trying to reduce their scope to emissions. That is you know, a lot of um, uh, terawatt hours that will need to be clean. And when we think about the, the hundreds or thousands of terawatt hours that are going to be, you know, that, that need to be clean in service of these net zero commitments made by 50% of the world's largest companies, that is billions, maybe trillions of dollars of investment in clean energy. And so how do those dollars get invested? Like, are they oriented toward an interim solution or the long-term full system decarbonization that we need? And, um, you know, like, we need, we, we need them focused on the right things that are going to drive, you know, as Wilson said, sort of these long-term um, long investments. And so, or long-term, excuse me, decarbonization. And amazingly, from our point of view, there are small incremental evolutions of the existing system that will do that. Um, and so that's why you know, we're, we're also calling for a sort of uh, location matching, sort of, um, sort of fixing the wind in Iowa for my data center in Georgia issue, and then the temporal matching that Killian described, um, you know, matching the, the, time of, you know, the, the time of the clean energy with the time of consumption, so which, which fixes the, um, the solar all night issue. So um, what would this do to our footprint? Was, I, was that your original question before I like deviated? No, no I think you're asking my, my question was, you know, how's it, how's it been going? You know, yeah. I, mean, I guess like, yeah. that part of that is why have you been doing it? But yeah. But you've, yeah. you've got the systems in place and... Yeah, we've got the systems in place. I mean, I guess what I would say like directionally, you know, directionally it would increase our footprint. I, like I think that's just, you know, um, that's what would happen. Um, if we move to more granular accounting, it would increase our footprint. Um, uh, but look, it's, it's very important um, to be honest about corporate, uh, about, about what, our, what our actual footprint is so that we're not obscuring the reality. You know, um, my colleague, uh, Devin, um, somewhere out here in the audience, uh, you know, he likes to say, look, you know, decarbonization is hard. Um, and if it weren't hard, we would have already done it. And so being transparent and being honest about our footprint is, um, I think, essential to, to help get us to sort of this end state of full system decarbonization. Great, thank you. And we'll come back to this issue of honesty, but Nathan, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you've been working on, because I think you've been doing a lot on hydrogen policy. Absolutely, absolutely. So my name is Nathan Iyer. I'm at RMI, founded as the Rocky Mountain Institute. 
And we have a lot of folks doing a lot of different work on carbon accounting, on procurement of clean products, on all levels of industrial decarbonization. We have a deep bench. And my focus on the federal policy team is pulling that all together, which brought me, of course, to hydrogen and the hydrogen tax credit that, that Wilson mentioned. Um, ultimately, scope two, when you bring it to the federal level and when you bring it to the world of compliance, ups the stake, sometimes substantially. And in this case, there's over $100 billion, potentially, between companies and a scope two system that determines whether or not the input electricity is clean. And so as a result, if you live in DC, you are going to hear all sorts of advertisements about very niche scope two topics. I was watching Wimbledon, and I heard an announcer um, or an advertisement saying, additionality is between jobs and America. And you know, I had, I had a buddy who, who called me the other day. He's like, I was, I was listening to a fantasy baseball podcast, and there was a, an advertisement about how annual matching is critical for America's future. <laughs> We've made it to the big leagues, folks. And what I think this, this represents is that when you make these accounting choices, and there's materiality to it, there's billions of dollars behind it, suddenly that decision becomes very contested. It becomes more than just what is the right data and what is the right model. It becomes, how does this impact my company? How does this impact my state? And suddenly, that is a whole different question in the realm of politics. And so, of course, the hydrogen production tax credit forced this question first because it provided money based on proving that your electricity is clean. But that is not the last time that we're going to have this debate. In fact, across industrial electrification, the same questions are going to emerge because oftentimes you want to prove that your product is clean. And there's an entire class of industrial electrification where consuming average grid power actually makes you not just dirty, but dirtier than the business as usual. And there's a number of examples, including direct air capture, thermal electrification, all fo forms of electrofuels and synthetic fuels. In those cases, you need a very low um, amount of carbon coming from your scope two emissions in order to even trade this, this good as a clean product, in order to procure it, in order to be rewarded from it from a government perspective. And so there are so many conversations right now that at its very core has a scope two deliberation um, happening, including trade between the US and the EU and India on what products are clean and how do you prove it. There's also all sorts of procurement, like buy clean, about folks who want to really procure clean steel. They don't want to procure dirty steel plus an offset. They need that credibility in order to provide the government money and the green premium in order to justify that market and build the assets, the industrial assets that we need in order to kind of you know, decarbonize that sector of the economy. And so to, to sum it all up, these conversations that we have are academic and are interesting and are pushing forward, but they're also being embedded in government policy that is going to define the next era of the energy transition. So the importance of these discussions and the politics of these discussions has amped up to the next level. And so I believe that if we take this problem and try to say what is credible and what is driving us to net zero and what is leading to optimized, pro um, optimized projects and geographies, I think we're going to end up with a system that we can build upon and we can have the, the certainty we need to make these 10, 100 billion to trillion dollar investments. We need to rewire and rebuild our entire economy. Fantastic. So you thought it was a niche topic, but in fact, the, <laughs> the tennis fans across the world are awaiting the outcome of scope two uh, <laughs> redefinitions. Excellent. Um, so let's, um, I think we'll come to the audience for some questions. And also, I'll invite online questions if, you, if you'd like in a moment. But I just want to come back to this issue um, in particular of this kind of credibility, integrity. There is a lot of pressure on companies to say that they're doing the right thing. They're getting to zero. They're getting it from investors, from consumers, from civil society. And in my experience, a lot of companies actually cannot get to zero absent wider changes in their market. But, it, but it's quite a bold leader that, that says that. So I wonder, you know, I think particularly Sarah, and, but maybe also you, Killian, like, how, you know, how do we persuade companies and leaders in companies to be honest and say, actually, you know, we're Google, we're 50% you know, decarbonized in electricity. We've got a big target, but we, you know, we can't make it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually, I, I think that's, I think that's spot on. It sort of, it gets back to this like honesty point, right? I mean, is it, is it better to be, you know, to say you're 100%, but to have people question that, 
or is it better to put forward a number that's more accurate and um, trustworthy? You know, um, in 2022, we were 64% 24/7, uh, so carbon um, carbon free energy across all of our data centers and offices, 64% uh, of the time. So. Um, uh, you know, I, and, and that, that is a very, like, we can stand behind that number, you know, and I feel, you know, my personal opinion is I, I think that is, you know, for, for, you know, Catherine, to your question, like, the expectations of civil society, like, I, you know, as a member, like, just as an individual citizen, like, I would rather hear 64% and know that it's real than hear 100% and kind of question what that number is. Great. And, and Killian, what do you, how do we get companies to do this then? I think it's a, it's a hard question to answer, to be honest, <laughs> because there's a huge desire, especially at C-suite level, to say, OK, zero, 100%, mm -hmm. nice, clean numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, unfortunately, what we've embedded here. Um, but we have no choice to get out of that narrative. I think you know, we need to start to have an accounting system that does reflect reality. 60% of, of the truth is, is way better than 100% of a lie, right? Like, so, so, but that is a challenge. I was talking to a, a very large pharmaceutical company yesterday, uh, a guy from their procurement department. He was saying, you know, I'm trying to explain to my board around, you know, the, the movements happening in carbon accounting, the need for more granularity, obviously the greenhouse gas protocol updates. Um, they don't get it. They're saying, hang on, I thought we were 100% renewable. I thought our job was done. We could close down the energy transition department. <laughs> you know? And now you're telling me we're not done? Uh, and, I, I, and I think that, that is a, it's, it's a really big problem. Uh, and I saw that myself. So I, I personally was involved in designing SPTI targets for a very large uh, heavy industry company. So you basically look at what can we do in scope one? Not a whole pile for under 100 euro per ton of abatement cost. So it's, it's, it's hard to do industrial CCS, et cetera. What can we do in scope two? a whole pile for very cheap, right? Because actually what the real problem is is that you're effectively on paper abating tons that in practice are not being abated at all. And so that allows you to spend one or two dollars per ton to kind of get the same paper-based outcome as doing the hard stuff. So that like path of least resistance that we've created in scope two is, is a really big problem because that's literally driving or not driving investments in clean energy. Um, so I think, you know, it's a very hard task, and I think a lot of bright minds need to be put to it, but we, we have, there's no way around it. We have to start to have an accounting system that getting to zero is, is going to be hard. And Wilson, can we use, you know, you've done research on this. I mean, if we got the kind of level of commitments that we're talking about, all these companies with net zero commitments doing, you know, what, what Google and others would like to see, you know, can we articulate what difference that would make uh, to the energy system? Yeah, I think it could be very significant. Um, not just in emissions, in which case, you know, we, our modeling shows that, uh, you know, a ambitious time match targets being actually implemented by um, commercial industrial consumers in the U.S. would reduce emissions substantially um, in the areas where they're um, making those procurements. But not only that, and I think the, the kind of like even potentially larger impact is that by attempting to actually match your clean power around the clock, you are incentivized to procure the technologies that are best positioned to allow you to do that. And that includes nascent technologies that are not actually going to see a market in the larger electricity sector at such an early stage. Things like advanced nuclear power, geothermal, um, you know, potentially uh, carbon capture systems or long duration energy storage, clean hydrogen. These are things that we know we'll need in the long term future when the entire grid has to decarbonize, but that do not really have a, a you know, strong market in the near term. And so by being kind of leaders in early procurement of these advanced technologies, like they were in early procurement of wind and solar back when they were just alternative energy and not, you know, something that can compete in mainstream markets, uh, I think these companies could potentially have outsized impact. Mm. So the role of corporates in creating that niche early voluntary demand. That's great. I've got a, uh, a question here online. I just wonder if there's questions from the audience. If you want to raise your hands, feel free to... Um, to ask something, yes. Does anyone have... Oh, we've got a microphone here, sorry. Can you just introduce who you are before you speak? Sure, my name is Neil Passero. I'm with PowerSync by American PowerNet. We deliver physical power to big companies. Uh, I'm curious if anybody's got a picture in their mind or a date from research when the development of renewable assets meets the demand from the corporate 
companies that we're talking about. Is there a window where we'll actually have that power in development, forget about interconnects, but just the date where development will meet the demand that we actually all want to help to deliver to the big companies? Mm, good question. I don't know who might be interested in I mean, I'm going to look at you, I'm afraid, Wilson, being the, <laughs> the, guy, the guy with the PhD on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, if you're talking about just the, you know, how quickly can we scale up clean power, I think the demand and the, you know, the, the financial incentive in the U.S. is absolutely there as, yeah. you know, as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, in our models, we're seeing that based purely on the financial incentives, we're expecting to see huge amounts of clean power growth, even you know, in excess of the demand from state clean energy standards, um, voluntary demand for clean attributes. And that's part of what drives the result of um, you know, bulk energy attribute procurements not being incredibly effective at reducing emissions is just because you know, the government has incentivized so many of those through subsidies that it actually begins to outstrip demand. Now, the, you know, practical uh, uh, barriers to clean energy at, you know, build out beyond just does this make financial sense are obviously going to be things like interconnection, permitting. Um, those will certainly uh, you know, potentially slow things down. But any additional kind of financial pressure from additional demand um, will provide more incentives to kind of like speed through that process. I mean, money talks after a certain, you know, after a certain point. Great, thank you. So I've got three questions now here. So let's start with the most controversial. Uh, is nuclear clean? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, can, I can take that answer. Um, and, and I think I, I want to take the, give, give that answer because it's, it's also something that is very political in, in conversation, especially in Europe. Uh, you have uh, some countries that claim nuclear is not at all clean, and some countries that is that saying nuclear is, is, is one of the firm, clean uh, energy sources. I think uh, answering this question really depends on how you define clean. Um, and the way, the way, for instance, in scope two, we define clean is what are the emissions of, uh, or what are the direct emissions of using a nuclear power. Um, and based on, based on such an assessment, one can say that nuclear is, in fact, a clean source. Um, and this, is, this goes beyond any of these political conversations. People can say, yeah, I, I don't believe in nuclear. We have to mine so much, so much of the fuel for it. But at the same time, we also need to think about that any type of energy technology has, has its issues of sourcing metals from conflict regions, sourcing resources from uh, across the world. <clears throat> but I think, again, the question uh, or answering the question whether nuclear is clean or not really depends on how you define clean. But if you look at it from the emissions perspective, uh, it is, in fact, clean. And would the changes in the, you know, in the protocol you know, make a difference in you know, a place like Austria where you're using quite a lot of French nuclear power? Like, does, that, does it matter? Would, how will it drive the, the decision making, do you think? Or would it not matter? Uh, I think it really depends. The EU uh, essentially has its own target setting. It's, it, I mean, national governments uh, have the opportunity to, to be more ambitious, but the EU on a, on a, on a continental level sets the targets. Um, whether or not the, the, a more accurate version of the greenhouse gas protocol can, can drive further investment, uh, I'm not an, the, the absolute expert on this to, to be able to, make an, to provide an answer here. But we also need to consider um, you know, what is the difference in generation or electricity production and electricity consumption. That is something we at Electricity Labs also uh, analyze. Uh, there is a difference between a country uh, like Austria that generates around 70% of, of its electricity from hydro relative to um, importing uh, nuclear power from Czech Republic or Slovak Slovakia. So, uh, and understanding this difference, that there's a difference in, uh, or that there's the, 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 the details between production and consumption, uh, that is defined in the greenhouse gas protocol. Right. The protocol defines you need to have, you need to take the emission factor of electricity that is supplied. Great. And I've just, got, uh, just oh. one point on the, on the potential, potentially how changing scope two could change the, uh, electricity disclosure in, com uh, in countries. So in Europe, there's like mandatory regulation around how you disclose energy sources or electricity sources to consumers. So I'm from Ireland, um, which is an island with very little interconnection. Um, so I, I was actually there last week talking to my former professor, and he was saying that in Ireland, based on how we you know, basically take certificates and they fly around Europe, uh, Ireland is 70 to 75% renewable, OK? Uh, 
in reality, the Irish grid is about 45% renewable. Mm -hmm. So there's a 30% flow of, of certificates coming into the country that inflate essentially the, um, you know, the, the true picture. So if you did have tighter boundaries coming in around, you know, you can only import as many certificates into Ireland as physical electricity, for example. That would change very significantly how consumers are receiving information about where their electricity is coming from. Um, so I think you know, it could very significantly change things. Really interesting. And a nice segue to the next question that I've got here, uh, which is the other solution to this question, which is what, what types of grid-related issues are blockers for developing 24-7 clean energy products? I don't know who... It's the other solution, build more wires. Uh, anyone want to take that? I could jump in. Okay. Um, I think, you know, as, as we stated earlier, the issue of you know, tracking and accounting for clean power in a granular basis granular basis is, you know, eminently technically feasible. I mean, we have smart meters at basically any, uh, you know, large-scale either generation or point of consumption. Um, I think the major barriers are going to be just, you know, the barriers to actual grid decarbonization, which are, you know, we need a suite of technologies that can give us clean power at every hour of the year um, in every location on the grid, and that's hard. Um, and so it's going to be just as hard for anyone looking to, uh, you know, meet an ambitious target um, on a kind of voluntary procurement basis. And so what that's going to require is investment in the technologies that can actually, uh, you know, deliver that cost effectively and deployment of those technologies. And a lot of them are quite nascent right now. Um, and so I think, you know, that the, the kind of technology for the last, especially the last, you know, 10, 20 percent of uh, power that would usually be you know, filled in by something like gas as a balancing resource for wind and solar. Um, that's going to be the hard part. But the you know, incentive structures that something like this would provide would actually be you know, what helps um, encourage development of those technologies. And that's, that's what we see in our models. And you know, I would just add to that, I think there's, there's a role for demand here, right? For companies to you know, bang on the door of their utility you know, and say, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to go to Iowa for, you know, wind farm for my, you know, again, to sort of power my data center in Georgia. I want you <laughs> to give me clean power. Um, and there is, um, uh, you know, yeah, I think that the voice, you know, especially if you can get the private sector to come together um, uh, and, and, and work collaboratively to, you know, sort of say, we want clean power, not just, you know, for us, but for the entire grid. Like, I, I think there is a role for the private sector to play there, too. Great. Any other questions from the audience? I've got some other online questions, but please feel free if you've got one to put your hand up. Yeah, the gentleman there, please. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ed Daniels. I, uh, I'm an advisor at Bain. Um, I'm curious, what do you think about the role, if any, of the traditional accounting companies? And uh, you know, do they need to develop their skills and capabilities in terms of company reporting so that this turns up just alongside the sort of financial statements with a similar sort of uh, uh, verification approach? Killian, you're extremely enthusiastic about that question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn to Nathan. No, no go on. Not visible. <laughs> <laughs> that was in my head. Um, well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take that. Well, I, I am quite enthusiastic about it because it's something that like vexes me quite a lot. Uh, I think the how seriously companies take financial accounting, very seriously. There's whole departments absolutely everywhere, uh, hundreds of people working on it. How, they, how seriously they take carbon accounting, well, look at the number of people who are doing carbon accounting in companies. It's usually one person and an intern. Uh, no one really understands what's going on. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, you know, in general, often, that's, there's obviously big exceptions, but in general, it's not really taken as seriously internally in companies or, to be honest, by the big auditors, you know? Uh, and I think that's kind of where we need to get to, where, uh, as you said, in, in, in a company's financial reports, you know, you, you have your profit and loss and everything, and then, you know, next page is, is the carbon accounts. Um, and, you know, when it's, it's taken as seriously a, a, as finance, then the board will take it as seriously uh, as finance. You know? And I, I think that's where we need to move towards, and we're very uh, far away from that today. And can I, can I add a point here on, on that particular concept? I think in some ways, a lot of the, the ecosystem of accounting is downstream of the rules and of profitability. Mm -hmm. If you have 
a compliance system that does require some of these more advanced techniques. The companies will figure it out because suddenly there's money involved and that's the job they need to do. So companies are you know, innovative yeah. entities that can respond to stimulus from whatever is required of them for any given market. And I think the second piece that's really important is that as we move from where we are now to closer and closer to a zero carbon grid, increasingly procuring clean power is just procuring power and you are going to pay for that power. And so being able to have that operational understanding of these resources are going to be around, and they're going to stick around, and these resources that we're relying on for reliability purposes or for power might be under threat for future regulation, that actually does become material pretty quickly. And so we will get to a convergence point where the finance department and the carbon accounting department are the same, and we want to make systems that sort of move us towards that convergence. Great. Yeah, lady at the front here. Juna oh, Suba from Steinberg Asset Management. I have a kind of a big picture question. I guess we're all here because we want to have an impact on carbon emissions globally. What keeps me up at night is to say we're supposed to bend the curve and we don't see any signs of it. So maybe there really isn't an answer here, but when do you think the energy transition will help to start bending that curve? What do you think? When do you think we'll start seeing that? You know, in what kind of time frame? And what do you think are kind of the major levers? You know, what's that one or two thing that's really going to make that difference? So we're, we're bouncing out of electricity 24-7 here and into when will we bend the emissions curve? Um, so <laughs> I think there's a lot of emissions curves that need to be bent all at the same time <laughs> uh, in a lot of different countries and a lot of different sectors. I would say there's probably like 15 different ones that, you know, right now it looks like we're going up, but in some countries and some places they are actually going down pretty dramatically and it depends on how you decompose the problem. But of course, you know, this is, this is a global issue and there are a wide range of policies that target each unique puzzle piece. And so I think what we're trying to do here is solve the, the electricity puzzle piece. And once those, those solutions become economical and we can scale them and we can deploy them for industry and for, for the Googles of the world, then we're going to start to see those changes. But a lot of the work is going to happen in that first 5%, all of the innovation, all of the structures, all the systems, before you really even see the emissions change. So I think it's important to note that we're making a lot of progress, we're solving a lot of puzzles, but that S-curve structure means that when the progress is already happening, then the the problem has been solved. So we're, we're in that first 5% ramp point where all of the tricky questions are happening, but we're not seeing all of the results of the good work we're doing. And I think RMI has done some tremendous work in, in sort of setting out the exponential growth curves in power in particular. So it is definitely the place that we should be starting. I have to ask this question because I'm also, as the, uh, the writer is, curious to get the panel's thoughts on this. So this is the lack of attributional claims um, for resources like electrification, um, energy efficiency, demand response, and optimized energy storage, uh, things like that. So we're talk I guess we're talking really scope four, the fact that you don't get credit for those things in, your, in the accounting system. You know, what, what does the panel think about that? I mean, I guess I would say, I mean, I, th I think you do in, insofar as some of that is behind the meter, you know? Um, in a more granular accounting system, right? Like you need hourly tracking to, to show the benefit of demand response, for example, from a carbon emissions perspective. And so if we move toward a more granular accounting structure, then I, th I think that resolves a number of those uh, limitations in the current system. Okay. Would, would, is, yeah. yeah, is there anything else? I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, just to maybe a point going, you know, I think really having companies optimize for what they understand really well and control, mm -hmm. uh, I think is very important they're going to be most effective. If everyone's doing their scope one and two job like really well, then you know, we'll decarbonize the economy. Uh, if there's kind of a get out of jail free card, so it's like, oh, that problem looks a bit tough. Let's just buy you know, a kind of an offset or, or something like this. Uh, or you know, then we can start to divert from the real issues. So that would be the kind of concern I would, I would have around that. So I think in having like, scope one and two accounting systems that do reward demand response, for example, that, that's, the way to, that's the way to go about it. I guess that's right, because if you start issuing recs for people that have electrified stuff, you've got a buyer of the rec at the other side, haven't you, which is the kind of what you're saying. Yeah, and, and, and also, like, ultimately, if that's being you know, quantified in a time of a, a carbon reduction claim, like that, that is, is, is maybe the case, but actually getting a number that's reflective there, making sure that's not a double-counted number, so like, yeah. other folks aren't claiming that same offset. Mm -hmm. It's tricky. Mm -hmm. 
Any questions from the audience? Yes. Mike down the front. I think, it's, I think it might be for the, because it's being broadcast. I think it's for the, it's on online as well, so. Okay. I'm Navreet. I work for Google, a very different department though, so I have no subject matter expertise. My question is, it seems like there's a demand and supply challenge, right? Um, so first, two questions. One, is it, are there places where there's supply, but corporates are not adopting it? Or are we even tracking it? Is there supply available, but we need to push more corporates to buy it? Second is when corporates are going and asking their like utilities providers for clean energy. Are they saying we want clean energy at the same price, or are they saying uh, we want clean energy and we'll pay whatever price it takes? That's interesting. So this is, I guess, an issue in some emerging markets where corporates are invested. Uh, who would like to take that one? I can jump in. Yeah, go on. I, I think there are issues on both ends. <clears throat> I think there are certainly cases, you know, there are a million clean tech startups at this point that have innovative ideas for long duration energy storage products or clean firm power who are you know, dying for offtake agreements for their early commercial projects. Um, and in those cases, an actual demand for things that can deliver the you know, clean capacity uh, contributions that aren't necessarily valued by our current um, you know, uh, clean energy policy incentives would be you know, enormous for the early success of those, um, those companies and those technologies. I think on the other hand, that is expensive. And, you know, these are early stage things. And so there are going to be places, and, and they're also you know, limited in how much they can actually deploy given their nascency. And so I think there are certainly going to be places where you know, it's harder to procure power. Um, you know, there, there's lower quality renewable resources, and there will be a significant upfront cost for anyone, especially trying to reach 100% you know, right off the bat. And so I think what this may lead to is kind of a, a kind of reset where the goal of being 100% as early as possible is not necessarily seen as you know, the, the optimal pathway, and that it's, you know, in reality, it means kind of ratcheting up your ambition to get to the point where you can you know, truly incredibly claim that you are 100% clean um, and that you're not reliant on fossil in any way. And that's something that's hard. I mean, this is a, a process that, you know, full grid decarbonization is a process that at the national level is expected to take decades. And so comparing that to, say, you know, a company's claim that they're 100% clean in 2023, the question then becomes, wow, that was really easy. Why aren't we all doing this? <laughs> and it's because it's, it's not actually that easy when you talk about meeting your entire electricity needs, both energy and capacity, with clean resources. Any other questions? I've still got some online, but feel free to put your hand up if anything you want to ask. So I've got a question here, which I think this one would be good for you, Nathan. Electricity is only 20% of total primary energy demand globally. Is this discussion too narrow? Too narrow? Well, I heard we're going to electrify everything. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> if anything, it's too broad. Um, it, it is a good point. And I, I think there is this, this, uh, this real problem where we actually have a dual a dual task at hand. And that dual task is we have to decarbonize the existing 20% electricity grid, and then we have to triple it. And we have to do those things at the same time. And sometimes we have to make a choice. Do we retire the coal plant, or do we electrify the next big thing? And actually, the scope two systems that we design sometimes implicitly makes that choice for us. It's either electrification forward, or it's retire the coal plant forward. And actually, it's embedded in the rules, and you wouldn't even see it unless you had a very discerning eye. So I think that when you look at the other 80% of energy, most of which we're trying to conquer with electrification, and we're looking at scope two systems, what we're really doing is we're setting up a structure of saying, how do we invest in it, and what is the sequencing? What do we do first? What do we do second? What do we do third? When trying to get deeper and deeper decarbonization. But yeah. I don't, I don't think it's too narrow of a conversation. And, and I'm afraid the, the IEA wonk that, that is still in me just has to say, well, it's 20%, but it's 40% of emissions. So, you know, because a lot of it's coal. So, and we've got solutions to it. So why not start there? Um, great. All right. I've got uh, any other questions from the audience? Or shall I keep going with my online questions? So this one, if two companies match, <laughs> sounds like some sort of puzzle you've got to solve. <laughs> if, 
If two companies match carbon-free electricity with their consumption on a temporal and deliverable basis, one with existing carbon-free resources and the other all with new resources, would they both be able to report zero scope to market-based emissions? I can take that one. Uh, if the accounting system permits it, then yes, they could both report that. The question of whether they are having equal impacts on total greenhouse gas emissions is a different one. And our research has been pretty um, conclusive in saying that the company that's investing in new clean resources is having a significant impact on uh, you know, grid scale carbon emissions because they're actually procuring clean power in hours when fossil fuels would normally be relied on that is additional to um, you know, what would have been there otherwise. Whereas if you procure power from an existing resource, at least one that isn't you know, at risk of retiring, that power would have been there anyway. And so you essentially slapping your name on it isn't having an impact on total grid emissions. And the question of whether those two things are considered the same under an accounting system is, is you know, a kind of higher level question of what should the accounting system be incentivizing. But we need Wilson on the advertising to, the, to Wimbledon, <laughs> <laughs> making the counter argument. Yeah, where were you on the TV? <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Any other questions from the audience here? Um, I've got one other question here, which is about um, carbon flow and stock. And I, th I guess, Killian, this might be a good one for you. So do you, do you account for carbon that needs to be expended to get to net zero? in the first place. So I guess this is the carbon that's, you know, that's used in producing the solar panels and the wind. So how do we think about that in the, in the accounting system? You mean the embedded carbon? I think that's what it is, because it's about carbon flow and stock, the question. So I think, you know, obviously when you're using yeah, renewables, yeah, 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 you've yeah, yeah, yeah. scope two, and maybe you could explain a little bit how that I think works. that sounds, to, uh, if I understand the question correctly, that's more, it's like a, a scope three I issue. So it's like further downstream. So obviously if I procure renewable electricity, uh, it has zero scope two emissions because it didn't directly emit carbon during production. But obviously, you know, a wind turbine, uh, a lot of steel, uh, you know, a lot of coking coal goes into that. So there's there's a certain amount of emissions embedded. It's still like much lower than it would be to just burn coal to produce electricity, but there is a certain amount of emissions embedded. Um, so that's considered in, in scope three accounting, not in scope two accounting. Great, thank you. And just to, to quickly build on that, I think we need to be aware of the fact that we've built a society that is you know, emitting CO2. And that also means if you want to transition to a society that does or reduces CO2, we will have to spend emissions um, to, to develop the technologies, to install the technologies that, that will help us to get there. But I think it is a fallacy to, to think about the fact that, oh, um, you know, wind power or wind power plants, they consume so much, they need so much cement and steel, and because of that they are unsustainable. I think that's, uh, I think that's a fallacy because we need to spend this, uh, we need to spend this carbon emissions. I, 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 call, I, I think of carbon emissions as a cost or a societal cost. Uh, this needs to be spent in order to make this transition actually happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and to just to, to add to that point, I mean, I think th this gets back to something earlier that Killian had said, you know, if we all solve our scope one, if we all solve our scope one emissions, right, I think that gets us, yes. like those, 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 those are the, the reality is there are actually only scope one emissions, right? Um, and so I think it gets to the importance of um, cleaning up the supply chains, you know, the, the scope one emissions of the manufacturers. It's funny that the conversation we're having on the panel, we are just had it also yesterday. I think it's yeah, reflecting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> reflecting the conversation in, in the private life. So we, we've got just 10 minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to come to everyone at the end to tell us you know, how we're going to persuade everyone that this needs to happen and, and, um, and get the, the right accounting rules. But let me just open to the floor again one last time if, in case, oh, we've got two here. Let's take both of them and then um, see where we get to. Hello, uh, my name's Clint. I work in solar installation in California. Um, obviously, uh, last week, California uh, proposed a new bill around scope three emissions. Uh, I haven't read too far into it, so I wanted to ask the expert panel, do you think the proposals go far enough? Uh, and what ramifications do you think it will have for the rest of the US, if not uh, the world? And then let's take this other one as well while we're here, just to make sure we... Uh, I'm Eliza. I am an independent ESG consultant, and most of my clients are mid-sized companies who are just getting started. What would you recommend for a company of that size who tomorrow is going to say we're going to procure renewable energy? Great question. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, um, Killian, I think, is that one for you, the sort of the latter one? Yeah, so yeah, the California regulation oh, or no, the latter no. one? The, 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 the Oh, yeah, well, you know, 
Um, I would, I, I've had this question before, um, and even if you go down to the level of, of like individual consumers who want to do something for the energy transition, actually I find sometimes they have less of an incentive to declare something that isn't, you know, isn't actually necessarily true. You know? If I go to you know, my parents, for example, when I explain to them the green energy tariff they were getting in, in, in Ireland from Norwegian certificates, my dad cancelled his contract the next day. <laughs> so, so I think you know, they first of all need to, you need to explain, like, you know, this is what the claim means. If you're going to say you're 100% renewable, there's, there's some issues there, uh, but go ahead and do it until that standard changes. Uh, but I, I would encourage even these smaller organisations to set themselves up now for a reporting system and a pathway that's future proof. Mm -hmm. That they won't have to explain in five years to their stakeholders that, uh, well, you know, we're not really 100% renewable, we're more, we're more 50%. I think everyone should start now addressing the, the, the reality and granularity of accounting. Right, and can someone very briefly take the California question? Because I want to give you all time to say what you think needs to happen. Uh, um, oh, go ahead, Wilson. No, was... Okay, well, California released this, this policy that requires, you know, all sorts of um, reporting of emissions for all the major companies that try to try to do business in California, which are most of them. And I think when you when you look at those big ambitious types of policies coming from state legislatures or coming from Congress, oftentimes the passage of the policy is step one of a very long process. And that process is figuring out the details and figuring out exactly how the state is actually going to put that into practice. And if you think about it from a policymaking perspective, the 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 pen on the paper of the law is the, the beginning, but there's going to be hundreds, maybe thousands of pages of more details that are going to come out over time. And so I think you should think of that as a contested process, as a process that will evolve, as a process that will improve over time, um, but also a process that will spread and you know, make the, the outcomes of these kinds of conversations more and more impactful in a material sense. Great, thanks. And so just finally then, if. It, you know, any words on you know, how, we, how do we build and broaden this campaign and get the right kind of accounting system? Who, who'd like to go first? I think I can take it. I, so I think to, to kind of step out of my academic shoes and editorialize a little bit, I think what's important to think about here is why we have these scope two accounting systems in the first place, why we care about people measuring the emissions impact of their consumption. And I think the simplest answer to that question is because we hope that by disclosing this information, by making it as accurate as possible, we can encourage people to take actions that have an impact on the problem that we all care about here, which is global climate change. And so given that lens, I think a good accounting system is one where the actions that people take to reduce their reported emissions under that system are actions that have a, you know, strong and credible impact on total carbon emissions. And so, you know, within that lens, I think that's really the, the metric we should be focused on is, is this having an impact on uh, climate change at the end of the day? Great. And how do we get people to, to believe or do that or take action, you know, on that basis? I don't know if Sarah, Sarah or Killian, you, you've been probably campaigning a bit of, on this. Um, do you want to start and then I can I, I add can, on? Yeah, sure. I've, uh, well, I think there's a very foc there's a real focal point in this whole conversation. So the um, rules, uh, the international rules for scope two carbon accounting, are embedded in, in a document called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is an extremely important one, um, which not a lot of people probably know about or understand its importance. It's the rule book for all EU corporate disclosures in the new EU regulations of so 50,000 companies. It's also the rule book for the California. Uh, mandatory disclosures. So, you know, if, if that has flaws in it, then all of those disclosures have flaws in them as well. So we need to, like, solve that root problem. That's under review at the moment. Uh, so, you know, as Energy Tag, along with partners in the NGO and corporate community, we're putting together a campaign to, to exactly advocate for more granularity in Scope 2 carbon accounting. Because if that standard changes, then you have a systemic change. Um, so. I would encourage everyone to, especially if they agree with what has been said on this panel, to yeah, just contact us and and, and write to a politician join. near them to. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, there, there is now is like a once in a decade opportunity, in fact, to to fix a lot of these issues systemically. So, mm -hmm. I'd encourage people to get involved in that process. Great. Any and anyone else, Cyril or Sarah, Nathan? I can I can just quickly speak. You, in the beginning, you asked about the feasibility and. 
essentially, what people are a bit afraid of is, is implementing, implementing these things in their own companies uh, and the question of do we have the data and tools available uh, to implement this. And I, it's going to be probably a hot take, but I don't think technology is the bottleneck. I think mm -hmm. corporate will and regulatory or governmental will is the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And once corporates and governments are able to agree on certain standards and rules, um, there will be a rollout. I mean, the EU, as, as Kilan has said, the EU has manda is mandating 50,000 companies to report based on the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, but I don't think the tech is the, is the problem. The tech is available today. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I get excited about when I think about this evolution towards more granular accounting is the kind of convergence of sustainability objectives with operational ones. You know, when you're aligning your clean power procurement with your sustainability goals, they, they, they all of a sudden, they're not, you know, the sustainability and the, you know, the, the, the clean power procurement isn't a marketing endeavor. Now it's about procuring clean power um, for your facilities. And that convergence, I think, is really powerful. And so, um, you know, just in, in conclusion, like that's, that's one of the things that, you know, gets me really kind of er, hopeful um, uh, about this evolution. Great. Nathan, you get the last word. Oh, boy. I had so much to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got two pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the, the, the key point here is that when we are building out the infrastructure of a decarbonized policy structure, um, having something that is off the table that is credible that governments can pick up yeah. over and over again and feel like they can trust it for, again, the buy clean, the international trade, the electrifying whatever product you can imagine. Having something that you can pick up and say, I trust that, and now I can build that next layer of policy and accomplish what I'm actually trying to accomplish and not accidentally create you know, a loophole or a path of least resistance that makes me spend all this money that ends up going into some other market that I wasn't intending um, in the first place. So, so setting up that solid system is something that is foundational to so much policy that I work on and that I've seen proposed and is coming down the pike that getting something that governments can really hold on to and build upon becomes kind of that next building block for all of the, the debates that we're going to be having over the next 10 years. Tremendous. Thank you. Well, it's been a huge pleasure to spend this hour looking up at these giants mm. of uh, renewable energy and decarbonization. So please join me in giving a hand to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.